I'm not pulling out of my driveway. We all know what that means. It's time for another Drive to Work Coronavirus Edition. Okay, so I've been doing some fun interviews. The fun never stops. So today I have Corey Bowen. Say hi, Corey. Hello, everyone. Okay, so Corey, um, let's start by, the question I've been asking everybody to start with is, how did you start playing Magic? Sure. So uh, I actually started playing Magic on my senior year of high school. Um, me and my friends had just gotten into Dungeons and Dragons, and then we were at a game store, and we were uh, just thinking, hey, if we're getting nerdy enough to play Dungeons and Dragons, how far can we go? Um, and I remember seeing that they had the little intro decks for uh, were uh, they were like very cheap or something. I looked over to one of my friends and I said, hey, if I get two of these, will you get two of these? And then we can play together. And then he looked over to another friend and said, hey, if we get two of these, will you get two of these? So the group of us, like six or seven of us, all ended up getting Interdex. And then we just went home and really tried hard to figure out how to play the game. I remember they also gave us a booster pack for free where my first rare was Enter the Infinite, which I really enjoyed. Okay. Okay, so um, so how did you get from there, from casually playing to uh, so the first time I met you would be your internship right so uh, after that I ended up going to school for game design um, I went to a school up here in Washington um, and when I went to that school it was full of a lot of other people who really enjoyed games but a lot of my close friends and roommates didn't yet play magic so I spent a lot of time trying to teach them and convert them into playing magic um, and while I was learning game design. And through that, I got really more invested in like the makeup of a magic card because I was trying to explain to these people what they can do, where they can go, the possibility space within the game. What what would be their favorite play to, their favorite way to play? Um, eventually, I on my junior year of college, I was looking for internships. Um, I found a posting for the Wizards internship via my school's website, um, and I got really excited about it. Uh, I applied for it. I uh, tried my hardest on the interview, and I got in. And, you know, that's that's the internship. So let's play real quickly for the people that don't understand. So um, the difference, we, a lot of, when you first come start a wizard, there's often um, periods of time where you, we, we, we call them internships. Uh, like when you win the great designer search, we call that an internship. But really, that's not an internship. Really, mm -hmm. that is you're being paid for six months, uh, and it's a uh, what's the correct term? Uh, it's a uh, what's the name of it? We, they, we pay you, but it's a uh, external um, like in a contract role. Yeah, it's a, con it's a contract role. Is what it essentially is. But what you were doing is an actual actual right. internship um, right. where uh, everybody, I believe, is in college or is just graduated from college. Yeah, um, they're either like on their way to senior or about to graduate. And it's this, it's during the summer, and I think it's 10 weeks, if I remember correctly. It was 15 weeks, I think. Was yours 15 know. weeks? It might have been 10 weeks. I might just be wrong with that. Um, but anyway, we've been doing it for many summers. Um, although I think you guys might have been the first of this program, the current program we have. Yeah, I um, remember that... Jules was an intern before me, but he was two years behind. So I was the first intern to come in with the current program we have now. Right, right. We, we, we've had different internship programs, but this is the current one we have now. And we, to this day, we just had our series of summer interns. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think this is the last week as, as we're recording this. Um, but anyway, okay, so what was the internship like? What did you do in your internship? Yeah, the internship was really cool. Um, it was, at first I was like really starstruck by like I had like read names of people on articles obviously yours um and like Adam Prozac, Dave Humphreys just all these people whose names I've read somewhere I like oh this is who they are so I was a little starstruck by that but um I ended up getting over that it was really fun um I had worked on the set design team of M19 during that and it was really interesting to sit in the design meetings figure out what they're looking for, what the process is, how their feedback loop works, other testing. Uh, M19 is core 2019, by the way. Just Yeah, yeah. Okay. core 2019, my bad. Um, and then at some point, uh, someone approached me with uh, a project that I, they were interested in me trying to uh, take ownership for or try out as an internship, intern thing. 
So I ended up uh, doing the Dominaria Planeswalker decks, uh, mostly by myself with the Council of uh, Hiyami. Um, and through that, I learned a lot about what you have to do to like, make cards that are more appropriate for a new player audience, and where complexity lines are, and kind of really zoning into what audience you're hitting, um, and what card demands what a card design needs to do to hit the correct audience, especially on a complexity line. Um, so a lot of my internship was, yeah, let's make M19, or let's make Core Set 2019, let's do some Planeswalker decks, and then let's sit in in a lot of other various uh, teams. Like I was, I, I remember being on some vision team with you that I don't, that I believe changed after I left. Um, it was like the archery two thing. Oh <laughs> yes, you were on yeah. the base. So originally, uh, baseball that slot, meaning the slot after Throne of Eldraine, was going to be a second set set on Throne of Eldraine, uh, and then mid vision we switched it over to make it Return of Theros. So you were on the long forgotten uh, Into the Dark Woods Eldraine set. Right, I thought that stuff was really cool. I was a little sad coming back after my internship and that not being there, but I understood why it wasn't. Um, but yeah, that was a lot of my internship. It was just really cool meeting a lot of uh, all these people who were very into magic design and just learning the ropes. It's so much different of what, what it means to design magic uh, in versus out of the building. Okay, so that was in between your junior and senior year, correct? Yeah. Okay, so now you go back for your senior year. You, you spend another year learning game design. Oh, wait, right. quick question, by the way. Since... Um, in learning game design, does magic come up much? Um, so I learned a lot of game design that was focused on digital development. Um, so a lot of, I don't know, I don't think magic came up a lot in my education, mostly because uh, like half my education was you need to learn how to use these programming tools to prototype stuff. And half my education was you need to understand the different drives and motivations that players have and how to integrate that in a game. And magic would come up if we were talking about, hey, this is what collectors like. Or magic would show up if we were talking about maybe resource systems. But overall, I didn't have that many lessons that were focused in on magic. Okay. Um, okay, so now you finished your senior year. So what What happened? How How'd you get back to, to Wizards? Yeah, so um, it was interesting. Actually, like after the internship... I believe I had, there was like, so after my internship, I had the choice, the choice is not real, but uh, the expected plan was after the internship, I would finish my senior year and then I would come back and work because that's kind of the cadence that they expect with the internship is, all right, finish your senior year and then start working. I actually talked to my manager who was Mark Gottlieb at the time and decided that I thought it would be the best for the path that I was on if I just went back to school for ha uh, just a half a year, finished all the courses I believed I needed to finish, and then started on the top of 2018. So that's what I did. Okay. And then I got a contract at the top of 2018. I came back, and I was super nervous. Uh, again, even though I had met all these people, I was like, oh, I'm nervous again. That's great, um, as, a, as a contractor. And then... Um, I immediately started working on some different Planeswalker decks, and I immediately started working on uh, the Ikoria Vision team, which I would be on through set. Wait, 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 we'll get to that in a second, but, but I just want to, uh, when you got hired uh, uh, so full-time, not as an intern, you, uh, there was a momentous uh, event that happened. Do you, do you, uh, are you aware of what record got set when you got hired? Yes. I, uh, I think we're talking about the same thing here, but I believe I am the first person to be hired on as a magic designer who is younger than the game of magic itself. Ding, 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 ding. That is correct. Um, like right. Jules was like six months older or something, but yes. uh, you were the first person to be younger than the game hired into R&D. So. Yes. I take great pride in that. <laughs> and at this point, there's a few other people working on magic that are younger than the game, but I believe I am among the youngest and am still, the, or obviously still, the first who was younger than Magic. Which yeah, I you, think you, you were the first. You were the, 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 the trendsetter there. Um, before we get into I want to start explaining what you did once you got full-time. But I just want to explain to the audience, uh, the way the internship works is when you get the internship, 
there is a possibility that the internship can parlay into a full-time job. It's not guaranteed or anything. Um, but if you, if we're impressed with your work and stuff during the internship and there's openings and things, that, that's something that can happen. And so, um, mm-hmm. at the end of your summer, we had meetings and stuff. We were talking about, what do you think of Corey? And stuff like that. So, um, we said nice things about you. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, okay. So now you start full-time. Um, so let's so, talk so, uh, Corey, you were on the vision design team at the end of the set design team, right? For Icoria? Yeah, so I was on the vision design team for Ikoria, and I went all the way through to the set design team. I actually talked with Mark Gottlieb, my manager at the time again. Um, for me, I really wanted to um, have a focus on one set. I wanted to figure out, I wanted for my first real team, I wanted to see the whole pipeline of one set. I wanted to sit from the beginning to the end, or close to the beginning because I wasn't an exploratory. But I wanted to sit from vision to set so I could realize more what are the changes and differences so I can have more perspective of was each role need or whatever. Um, well, so let's, I entered. Let's do that. Okay, so you were on Icoria from almost, you weren't exploratory, but almost the very beginning to almost the very end. So what was that like? Yeah, it was really interesting. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, vision was Vision was very unique. Like, we had this idea of the mutate mechanic, you remember? I remember in Vision it was very tribal-focused mm-hmm. for a while. Um, yeah. The set was a very tribal set. We were just coming up with these wild ideas, uh, shooting some stuff. We had a list of potential space from exploratory. Remember, at some point in Vision, we started talking about deck-building restrictions and, like, hey, can we make it feel like you're bonding with a monster by you paying this deck building cost to coerce it? And that's where Companion was coming up, uh, coming out from. Um, I remember all of the different Companions we tried, or maybe we tried most of those in set. But Vision was a lot of, hey, what if this worked like this? What if that worked like that at a mechanical level or a mechanic level rather than a card, card by card level? We came up with different cycles. And we were just really trying to explore what themes and cycles and mechanics would make this set really feel like this set. When we got into set design, uh, kind of the first question was, all right, we have a vague outline of what the archetypes are, but let's start thinking about what the draft archetypes are. And then let's start, uh, so we have all these mechanics, can we fit them into color focuses? I remember that's one of the first times, I think I kind of, pushed Dave, or at least was a voice to say, hey, I think red-white cycling would be kind of a unique archetype that we don't do very often and would push away from the red-white is always aggro mentality that was um, a little prevalent, I think, at the time. Um, So I wanted, so we did that, we did the archetypes, it was really fun. I find my, my favorite part about set design or maybe the magic design pipeline is the beginning of set design when you're setting up all the archetypes because I think it's really fun to make all the cards that fit really neatly into those archetypes. Uh, But yeah, set design was just a lot of, uh, with Dave Humphreys particularly, it was a lot of iteration off of this, off of whatever Vision gave us. So Vision gave us all these mechanics and Dave really wanted to take those to heart, figure out their best executions. Um, and so we were just going over, hey, what's the best way to do mutates? Let's iterate, iterate, iterate. Hey, what's the best way to do companion? We had all these wild companions. At some point, we had a companion that cared about rarity, which I thought was really funny. Um, I don't know. Is it, does that satisfy your question? What I mean, I, one thing I find very interesting is I love getting sort of the outside, you know what I'm saying? Like you were new to yeah. it. So like, like for example... What did Vision do that you did not expect Vision to do? Like, what did Vision Design do that you just didn't expect it to do? Um, it's kind of interesting. Like, I think what I think I'm going to flip this and say I expected Vision Design to care about the archetypes, but they didn't as much as I thought they would. Um, most of what I learned between Vision and Set was how much. I felt like a lot of what I learned is that a lot of set design leads treat their sets very differently and that vision and set were closer together than I thought they were. I thought they were going to be completely different realms, but I think I ended up thinking that they were closer together than I thought they were and that vision is kind of unique for every set. 
for Icoria Vision, we came up with, or we had the mutate mechanic, and we just fleshed out what it was, and we spent a lot of our time saying, we found the fun, let's find more. But I know other sets have a different struggle during Vision, and so I kind of learned that different Vision design teams have different needs for different sets. On Icoria, it was pretty much, hey, we have this thing that makes you feel like a monster. I wonder what else can go on, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, no. Like I said, the uh, what's fun for me, like one of the things that, that's cool for interviewing you is as a young, as a younger designer is, um, like I, I've been doing this a long time, so I can I can think back to my like pre Wizards days, but that was a long, long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas you know your your pre Wizards days weren't that long ago, so it's I, I like I like the insight, so that that's cool to me. Okay, so beside working on Ikoria, um, you also worked on. Uh, Core 2021. Right. You were on the set design team? Yeah, eventually I was on the set design team for Core 2021. Um, I wasn't on it for the whole time. I was more on it for the first half where I got to do my, like I said, my favorite part of set design, which was advocate for my favorite set archetypes, my two color archetypes. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how some of, I think, the more ambitious archetypes came into Core 2021. I was also trying to solve the problem of, um, hey, blue-green is often an archetype that is not very well defined in core sets. What is a blue-green thing that I could uh, convince Adam would be fun for a core set that feels more unique? And I had ended up trying to think really hard on what I've seen. Like, what part of magic have I seen people who like blue green really really enjoy like I've seen people play blue green I've seen them enjoy magic the gathering what part of it were they enjoying and I decided that the part the thing that blue green players liked a lot was drawing a lot of cards and so I was trying to convince Adam hey is there a form of blue green card draw that we can make an archetype and I uh basically my pitch was isn't lore scale quadl cool uh (laughs) uh they, yeah, they tried out that, and yeah, I think it went out well. It made a few funky-looking uh, green cards, but otherwise, uh, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm also really happy with dogs. I think dogs is a really cool thing in M21. Yeah, so, upset 2021. You like changing up red white? That seems to be your theme. <laughs> yeah, I just like I just want to flip some known stuff, known constants on their head. I want to want to make archetypes that we haven't really done before and i recognize that like you can't just do that with every archetype you need some grounded space but i think there's a lot to explore with the red white and blue green um because they're often like this set mechanic thing or aggro slash ramp kind of deal okay so let's one of the things that happens at wizards is um people sort of start learning where they're like, they start concentrating what they do just cause part of getting good at something is doing it again and again. And so a very common thing is you tend to find sort of, uh, not that you can't do a bunch of different things, but you tend to find your center, right? The thing that you sort of focus on. So, um, Icoria is also, I think where you, we, we, you, you started to find sort of your center, um, which was you were in charge of commander for Icoria, uh, yeah. commander 2020. And just to let the audience know, you, one of the major roles you do now is you do a lot with Commander. So yeah. I would love to talk a little bit about Commander 2020 and sort of your transition into being one of the Commander people. Yeah, of course. So before I came to Wizards, I played a lot of Commander because it was the easiest way to get my friends to play the game, um, especially in a kind of a low competitive environment. I, I do like draft a lot, but I just like played Commander a lot more for that reason. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as an intern, I, I made the Dominar Planeswalker decks. And then when I came back and was hired, I made the Ravnica Planeswalker decks. And then I made the War the Spark Planeswalker decks. And then I made the Eldraine Planeswalker decks. And now we're just like in this cycle of, hey, I'm getting practice making pre-constructed decks for a targeted audience with a focus on uh, identity. Because Planeswalker decks have share something with Commander decks where... You kind of there's an appeal to the identity of the character on the front of the box, um, and then I made some of the Theros Planeswalker decks, although I handed it off kind of late into there. And then when we were talking about the Ikoria Planeswalker decks, at some point someone's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! 
I have this really great idea. What if we just make commander decks and say, like, the commander set is in Ikoria, and then we don't make Planeswalker decks because that kind of takes up that slot. Uh, and they're like, okay, let's do that. But uh, who should lead it? It's like, okay, well, who likes Commander and has been making the products in the slot for a while? And who do we think can do this? And at some point, someone asked me uh, if I was interested. And I was like, am I interested? Like, I've been on Ikoria for the past year. I love Ikoria. I love Commander. I've been doing these pre-constructed slots or pre-constructed decks for a while. And I am hungry for leadership opportunity. So I kind of jumped on that, was very excited to do that. Um, I had Glenn Jones on the team who had led C19, um, Commander 2019, uh, to help mentor me through a little bit because it was my first lead and I had actually not been on a Commander product beforehand. I just was already in love with the format because of my experience playing it. Um, So I started leading Commander 2020 and I remember when it was in Vision, I had like sent the vision lead, Ethan Fletcher, uh, a document that was, hey, I've been on Ikoria for a long time. Here's kind of my initial thoughts and ideas of good deck building directions. Uh, Because I I remember they immediately did not, their first idea was not Jeskai Cycling, but I really wanted it to be Jeskai Cycling. So I sent that to Ethan and he said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it. Um, And so, I mean, everything just worked out really well in terms of my timing to finally get to work on Commander 2020. And when I was leading it, it seemed to be going well. I was really focusing hard on figuring out how to be a good lead, how to be, how to lead uh, my team well and communicate well. And I actually had one-on-ones with a lot of different leads in the building to try to ask, to ask them, hey, what can I be doing to be a better lead? What are some teachable skills I can learn to and better better suit this role, so they asked me to do it again, basically. Um, and I remember at some point wanting to put in the partners, the partner with commanders in that set, and that yeah, went swimmingly. I don't know. That's basically how I got there, and I really enjoyed that product. So real quick, just so uh, um, a lot of people might not know this, uh, when you're leading uh, a product like Commander, where it's a deck-based product, mm-hmm. um, usually the way it works is you have... T- uh, team members equal to the number of decks that you have, and then yeah. each person takes a deck, right? Is that how it works? Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. Um, so, what was, I mean, I, I think we went into Ikoria knowing we were doing three color, the wedge, because the wedge, we built yeah. wedge into um, the set at higher rarities. Uh, and I think that was the, the, the impetus to jump to Commander in the first place was we knew we had three color identity, yeah. and um, Commander tends to like, um, you know, more, more color identity stuff. Um, so what, what is your, well, so, so the, the, well, actually, first I'll ask, what did you learn? What, what was your big takeaway from, from leading that project? My big takeaway, I learned a lot, like all, a lot of my takeaways were, what is it like to lead a team of five? Um, just like a team where I have to delegate and make decisions. I learned a lot about um, making a hard decision versus kind of wavering on everyone's opinions for a while. I, I figured out that, oh, actually, we move a lot faster if after everyone gives me their opinion, I just choose one that my gut or that I feel is is a well-placed decision instead of thinking about it for a few days. Um, and sometimes you think about it, but sometimes you just need to move forward when you have so many cards to make. Uh, I learned a lot about... I learned even more about audience, I think. Like, I, I said this a little bit earlier in how much Planeswalker decks taught me how to design cards to a certain audience, but with Commander, there's a lot of different ways to play Commander, and I had to really focus in on what cards would be for what different audiences and, uh, like, cards for spiky Commander players, cards for more deck-building puzzly players, cards for people who just want things, crazy thing, crazy fun things to happen in their game. Like, there's all these different ways to play and enjoy Commander, and leading a set of it, I kind of got to, got to realize what previous Commander sets had done in the past to build all of these different Commander feelings, and I wanted to also represent all those Commander feelings in this set while also 
feeling a lot like Monster World, if that makes sense. So, okay, so um, while you've been working on Wizards for a little while, we have a long lead time. Um, mm -hmm. So this actually, earlier this year, was the first time something you worked on, well, I guess Core 2019 came out, but uh, yeah. as far as something you had worked on extensively, like at Ikoria, you were there yeah. for all of Vision and all of set design, and you made the Commander decks. What was it like to have Ikoria come out? What was that like? Ikoria coming out was really wild. Um, it was a little bit hampered by the current state of the world and how much I had to be inside my apartment. Yeah. But it was really exciting watching people react to cards. I'm, I'm, and I, I think to some extent every designer is like this, or maybe every creative worker or person is like this, but I was very anxious about my output. Um, I think one of the things I took away from leading this set was the realization that I don't think game designers will ever feel finished with their work. Um, I think that they will hand something in and then still think that there's stuff that they could have worked on um, or improved about it. So I felt very anxious um, because I'm also an anxious person. I really wanted people to like and enjoy it. I really wanted this thought and work I put into it to succeed. Um, and so when I saw a lot of different positive comments about all of these cards and even some cards that I thought were going to underperform, um, there were certain audiences who I did aim them at who ended up telling me that those were some of their favorite cards. Like they really enjoyed those cards that would underperform for different audiences but hit those audience, uh, those other audiences very well. Um, so it was really, really exciting. I think you learn a lot seeing your first product release because you really only get the feedback of your peers and other designers um, while in design. But when it's released, you get the feedback of like thousands of other impressions, uh, tens of thousands of other impressions maybe. But I don't know, I was really excited. Uh, it was great having Ikoria and the Commander set come out because with the main set, I just saw all these fun rares and mythics that I thought were goofy and cool come out and hearing people's reaction to those. I was like, yes, I made these because I wanted you to feel charmed by them. And when the commander set came out and people would attach to different legends I made for different reasons, it's like, yes, I made those so you would be excited about them. I'm glad you are excited about them. I'm glad you noticed this little thing about this weird monster. I'm glad you noticed that this card has this kind of interaction. Um, so that was just all really, really cool, really overwhelming. Um, and I, I wish I could have gone out and played and pre-released with people with them. Um, yeah. But alas, I have not been able to. Yeah, one of the side effects is funny. One of the perks of this job is the amount of feedback you get on the work you do. It's yeah. Like you make something and then millions of people play it and they'll, they they share the information with you. Um, and it is, it's very, it's very humbling in, in a lot of ways just because like it, when you're in the building making something, you know, it, then it, when it goes out to the world, like, there's just all these people. Like, it's one thing to, like, intellectually understand that a lot of people are going to play it, but it's another thing to see them playing it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to when we are in better times and I could attend a physical command fest and I could roam the tables counting cards that I've helped or had a hand in and seeing how much fun those players are have, are having. So any other, as we're, I'm, I'm almost to my uh, desk here, um, any other, like, uh, of your time at Wizards, any other, any other last things you want to talk about? Uh, a lot of my focus at Wizards have been stuff that I don't think I can talk about yet. <laughs> All this um, cool stuff you've done that you can't... <laughs> Right. There's just like been a lot that I've worked on that is yet to be released. A lot I'm working on right now that's at the forefront of my mind. Um, I guess like for commander players listening to this, like, hey, get excited. Like commander's really cool and we love commander. And listen, I'm on it, man. I'm going to make it great for, for all of you. <laughs> yeah, there is. I mean, once again, we, we can't say everything, but there is lots of commander goodies coming your way. Right. So, okay, well, it was fun talking with you. And like I said, the, uh, um, one of the things I've been trying to do with the interviews is show people just all the different kinds of people working on magic. And um, 
last week I talked to somebody that had been an alpha playtester, you know, going all the way back to the beginning oh. of Magic. Um, and you were one of our young, one of our younger sort of designers. So it's it's nice seeing that, you know, like, like I said, you're someone who grew up on Magic rather than someone who like, like I I was uh, well out of college by the time I met Magic. So it, right. it's that uh, cool. But anyway, thanks Corey, thanks for joining us. Uh, and guys, yeah. I'm oops, sorry, go ahead. Oh, thanks, Mark. <laughs> Um, so I'm at my desk now, which means, we, we all know what that means, it means the end of my drive to work. So instead of talking magic, it's time for me to be making magic. So Corey, once again, thank you so much for being with us. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you so much for having me. Uh, guys, I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.